All right. Um, we're back for remainder of lecture one. So this is the theme that I started out with, which we're going to continue for the next uh, rest of the week. And we got up to the point of, now I have to do the, oops, oh. Well, why is it not going? Do I have to do it from here? It appears rather stuck. Can we get someone? Or maybe somebody? Oh, okay, never mind. Now somebody else goes to bring that one and the other one. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Now I had to do this rather indignified way of, uh, since I'm on full screen. Uh, right, so we did all this stuff yesterday and we came to the point, oh, I'm, I'm still in the middle of going through the size. We came to the point where we were talking about, so we found out that in a homogeneous environment, in a constant environment, you often do not get coexistence because of the, there's insufficient nonlinearity. So you get these things like the R star rule and the P star rule, right? So then I said, well, there are ways, there are mechanisms by which local nonlinearity in itself can allow coexistence in the absence of any spatial or temporal variation. And that's where I want to pick up today. So, so this is what it is. So I said there are two. Uh, one is this interspecific trade-offs leading to partitioning of resources and or natural enemies. Now, so for example, one species is a superior competitor for a common resource, it has a lower R star, but it's susceptible to a common natural enemy, meaning it has a higher P star. Now there's one thing about trade-offs you have to be very careful about. So people always invoke these interspecific trade-offs to say, oh, that could live, you know, species A is good in X, species Y is good in Y, they should coexist. It doesn't work like that. That trade-off must mean that there is some, that there is non-linearity in the negative feedback processes such that each species limits itself more than it limits the other. So this is a very important thing because I think a lot of ecologists tend to say, oh yeah, these species exhibit this and that. We expect them to coexist, but this is uh, the really remarkable contribution of Peter Chesson is to show, to point this out, that it's just not enough. It's, it, it generates maybe differences that are in what he calls fitness differences, which is barely just a difference in the two per capita growth rates. One has a higher rate. Oh, no, no, don't do that. What? Okay. Uh, where was I? Oh. So, um, where was I? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I mean, just because, so, so the fitness differences are, you had just differences in the per capita growth rate. So the one with the higher per capita growth rate is supposedly like, you know, is superior, but the thing is, then it was just simply that difference would lead that species to exclude the other, which is exactly what we are seeing with the R star and the P star rules, right? But there has to be a little bit more than that. You have to have enough nonlinearity in their local dynamics such that their species tend to somehow experience more stronger intraspecific competition relative to interspecific competition. So it's a much harder problem than you might imagine just invoking a trade-off. So we are going to go through and sort of identify how an example, we're going to go through an example in great detail so you can identify, we can identify the mechanisms that allow such a trade-off to generate the necessary non-linearities, okay? And that's the really, for a, if you're building a model based on a system, this is the crucial challenge, this is the key challenge you have, is to show that this trade-off can actually generate the non-linearity. So I found in my insect system is, for example, there is a trade-off seemingly, but it doesn't actually generate that kind of non-linearity, okay? So, so that's the thing.
Natalia, I can't uh, move the slides. You can't move the slides? Oh, wait, wait, okay, I can, never mind. Oh, okay. It gets stuck from, okay. So the second mechanism is a different one. It's called relative nonlinearity. That's a term given by Peter Chasson. Now the idea is that species have different nonlinearities in their responses to a resource or a natural enemy. Remember we saw functional response, for example? And what this does is to give them an advantage when they're rare. See, that's the thing, right? When you're rare is when you have a disadvantage because your competitor is abundant. It's the best case scenario for your competitor, the worst case scenario for you. And that's why we look at invasibility because if they can invade when they are at a great, the greatest disadvantage, they can invade at any other time, okay? So that's the whole kind of rationale for us saying, can a species invade when it's in small numbers, but its competitor is at a steady state, right? It's doing as well as it can, right? So, so the, here's the thing, in both these cases, there should be a negative feedback in, for, in, in terms of density dependence, is that what we're thinking about, such that species limit themselves more than they do others. And this, and this is the tricky part. This leads to a sort of a local niche partitioning in the absence of environmental variation and stable coexistence. Our challenge is to work out what that niche partitioning is. It's not always obvious. Okay, so you can't just say trade-offs, you can't just say they have different nonlinear responses, you have to show that they generate nonlinearities above and beyond what we've seen in the previous models, so that there can be coexistence locally within a community in the absence of any variability, okay? So in a way, this is a harder problem than when you invoke variability. All right, so we are going to look at coexistence via interspecific trade-offs, and the key here is that we are going to show that this, these trade-offs lead to resource partitioning, and as we know, if they partition resources, they interact with, each species interacts more with its own members, right? Members of its own species than different species, because there's, they're, they're, you know, they have a partitioning of resources. There's more than one resource they can partition, right? So I'm going to use an example called intragill predation. And this is a very common thing in nature. You get them from protists to mammals. So here, species that um, compete, so there are two species that compete for a common resource, but they also themselves, um, what? How did I go that far? Okay, uh, maybe I don't need that. Um, so there are two consumers that compete for a common resource, but generally you don't have a cross interaction like that, right? Generally there's an indirect, remember exploitative competition is indirect, right? Here there is a direct interaction between consumer one and consumer two because they engage now in a consumer resource like a trophic interaction. One can eat, prey on or parasitize the other, okay? So you have a predation parasitism link between the two consumers, but they also use a common resource. They're competing, but they're engaging in, it's a very unique type of interaction. They're also engaging in a predator-prey, host parasite type interaction, okay? Right. So here the equations is a very simple model that to describe this, um, this community, this three species interaction, you have a resource species, um, it has self-limitation through logistic growth, and these are type one functional responses, okay? And we're doing type one functional responses because we want to actually distinguish between this and the second mechanism, okay? So we don't want any oscillatory dynamics coming in and confusing the issue. Plus it makes it a lot more easy to analyze. And so this is, Okay, equation for consumer one, you can see that it has, it's, its consumption translates into reproduction. There's a death rate, and the same for consumer two, but there are two additional terms here, right? These, the, the, what we call the intra prey has a negative term. It has another term like that where it suffers mortality due to predation by the intra predator 
And that translates into a net benefit for this integral predator predator with a conversion efficiency that we denote by f. So you understand that, right? If you forget about these two, this is just the model you saw before where we derived the R star rule from, right? For yesterday. You should, uh, you should, well, you should have these notes and the second set of notes for today, the lecture two and spatial variation, okay? Um, so, did Natalia send them? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, okay. So, so you see there's an additional mortality term for the prey species and an additional benefit term for the consumer. So these are now two species that engage in a mutually negative interaction, but also an antagonistic self, you know, conflict of interest. Very interesting situation, right? And the really good thing about it is not a toy model because this happens in nature all the time. It's very, very common, right? So now, in order to analyze this model, we are going to use non-dimensionalization. Non now, all of you from physics and math mathematics know this. How many people have not heard of this, the non-dimensionalization? Good, I'm gonna go through it, good. So the, here's the thing, it's a good way to simplify a model. First, it reduces the number of parameters, but even more important when you do, basically what you do is you divide, multiply things so that there are no units, right? So of course this means you actually have to know the units of your parameters, which is a very, very good thing to do. Anytime you write an equation, you know from like, you know, the units on this side has to have to balance out. When we don't do this usually, sometimes people use units not actually being aware that that's a violation of this rule, right? So it, 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 and then when you do that, something really magical happens because when you do it, you will identify the natural scaling relationships between parameters that might actually have biological relevance. So it's a fun thing to do. When I started out, um, my advisor said, this is what you should really do this all the time. And I think I only stopped doing it after I started doing things like delay differential equations where it was just too difficult. People couldn't understand them even in the, you know, the easiest form. So, but anything I did before that, I always did this because for my own benefit, I could see how things scaled. It's a kind of a fun thing to do. Go home and try this. And there are different ways you could do it, but you can always see the scaling and I'll sort of help you along here with an example, okay? All right, so we are going to scale species abundances by the carrying capacity. So for the resource, we would say R hat is equal to R over K, and that's a really good metric because, you know, if you, if you look at a population, say its number is 50, that really has no meaning, right? But if you know whether the number is closer to the species carrying capacity or away from it, that's actually meaningful. So when population size is more relative to the carrying capacity, this is a smaller proportion, and it tends to one when the population, so that's a very informative thing. One population is 0.4, one is 0.9. You know that that one's the second one's under stronger density dependence, right? It's very close to carrying capacity. What can you say about the per capita growth rate? It's approaching zero, right? Right, because K is an equilibrium of a logistic system. Right, and then we do the same thing for the consumer, but remember, K is not a carrying capacity of the consumer, we have to weight it by its conversion efficiency, right? Because it's not, it's, unless it's one to one, it has to be scaled by the conversion efficiency. So these are the species abundances. And then we scale the background mortality rate by the resource growth rate. So the consumer's mortality rate is now scaled by the resource growth rate. Then you get a metric, a rate divided by a rate is a unitless non-dimensional quantity. And it's a really good thing to know, right? It's the consumer mortality versus the resource growth rate. It's actually something important and it falls out like that. That's the sort of the fun part. And then we scale the attack rates by using the conversion efficiency and these, the attack rate, the conversion efficiency, and these resource traits. So this is the IJ prey and IG predators attack rate on the resource. It's the same thing you saw yesterday. And this is the IG prey's attack rate on the IG prey. You use a hat to denote that that's the non-dimensional quantity, okay? So now you're going to ask me, like, how did that come out? So when you start doing it, in fact, I think if you have time, I would try this in groups, like small groups, if you haven't done this before. Uh, and people who know it, you can't act like, like the two smart people, you have to like help everybody, like you know, you know what I mean. But basically like the thing is when you keep dividing and 
arranging things, some things will naturally fall out this way. Say you divide by the carrying capacity, then you look at the consumer term, you realize, okay, what do I have to do to this? You, you know, you multiply divide by k, k over k, right? So you do things like that and these things fall out and that's the beauty of it. When it falls out like that, that's telling you the things that matter to that carrying capacity. Sorry, the, that attack rate, right? It's got resource rates and it's got the, two, the consumer's birth rate scaled by these two resource traits, resource growth rate and its current capacity, which is an indication, sorry, the, this is an indication of strength of density dependence. The lower carrying capacity means stronger, weaker density dependence. It's stronger, right, because you have only a smaller level to, you can only come so far before the population is, becomes limited completely and cannot increase further, okay? So that's an, so this is why I like Q. Larger the per capita competition coefficient because can capacity is like this really abstract term. Okay. Um, then we have a metric of conversion efficiencies. Remember E1 and E2 are the conversion efficiencies for the resource for, for resource consumption for the two consumers, F is the, i.e. predator's consumer, conversion efficiency of the nutrition it gets from IG prey. So it's really nice to have these two together because we will see that it actually matters a great deal to our model. And then there's one really important thing is we scale time in terms of the resource species growth rate, right? So now everything, so then this gives us, that's the whole thing we get all these um, scaling relationships. We put these now into the model and you can see we got something a lot. Excuse me. Yeah. Do you guys listen? I'm sorry, I'm here from home. <laughs> I can't hear. Uh, could you come back one slide please with all the scaling relations? Yeah. What's the D again? D over R? I'm sorry, that oh, one. Oh, so that's the consumer's mortality rate scaled ah, by yeah. the resource growth mm -hmm. rate. Yeah, it's the one I did second after those two. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I couldn't yeah, yeah. catch up. No, fine. Yeah, <laughs> Thank you very nice. much. <laughs> she was home. <laughs> yeah. uh, a similar question, uh, what is the I and J again? Oh, so it's just a notation. So see, I have say I, right? I could mean one or two. Species one, so you have two species, right? So when you have I, you can basically substitute, I could be one or two, but they're not equal to each other. So basically like, mm -hmm. so that's for species one, it will be C1 over C1 over E1K. Species two, it would be, so it's like this. So C1 hat would be E1, sorry, no, uh, C1 over E1K, right? And then C hat 2 would be C2 over E2K. If I were to write them out, that's a lot to write out. So what I say is I just write it once and I say that's I, right? And I, you substitute either one or two for I, okay? It's just a matter of notation. Oh, I see. Okay, you see like because it's just a, Notation is where we simplify things so you don't keep writing the same thing over and over, okay? Very good point because it's the first time I've probably shown you that and I didn't explain it. So basically all I'm doing is I'm taking a shortcut because otherwise I had to write C1, C2, D1, D2 and instead so like every time there's an I, you can either say consumer one and put an one in front, you know, instead of the I or you could say it's consumer two and you put a D2, okay? So actually, here, that's exactly what I've done here, right? You see. So here is AI, before I had AI, but so now I drop the hat. So this is a thing that physicists tend to do, which sometimes annoys the biologists. You said it was hat. We drop the hats and we pretend now these are the new parameters because hats are hard to deal with. Um, so I know like I've had this, thing. I have no problem with it, but a lot of like Tom's and people say, but you said it was hat and now we have no hat. Is this the same thing? No, 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 anyway. So, but we now pretend these are the non-dimensional thing. When you want to go back, we put the hat back on and 
then we just sort of, you know, go back and forth, right? So you can always go back and forth, right? This thing always gets stuck, oops. Here, you can go back and forth, right? You can go to the original thing. If you want to like, okay, now I don't remember what alpha was, then you go remind yourself. So it, it's a really nice thing. So of course we know that to establish that coexistence can occur, we need to establish conditions for mutual invisibility and stability. You already know that. And here's something you now are going to see in your nightmares. Um, mutual invisibility is when each species has to be able to increase when they are rare and the other species are equilibrium with the resource. So, but here's the thing, and someone I, yesterday asked me this question too. It's telling you when each species can increase when they're aware, while, when it's while its competitor is abundant, it's telling you that a coexistence equilibrium can exist. It's very important actually, meaning it's feasible. So mutual invisibility is also a feasibility condition. What is feasible in common terms, like you know, common parlance? Something is possible, right? So basically what it's saying is, what we are really after is this. C1, C2. If they coexist, where should their abundances be inside in this square? Should it be at the axis? So if I said here's an equilibrium, what's that? What does that tell you? That C1 is zero. C2 is at equilibrium with the resource, right? I'm only doing this in two dimensions, right? If there's an equilibrium here, that's saying C1 only, right? The axes are just for one species, right? So tell me, where should it be? Where would I draw a circle if there is coexistence? In the interior, right? So that's what we say. So when they are small, see that's the initial condition, they should be able to go. So somewhere here, I'm just making this up, there should be a coexistence equilibrium, meaning it's an attractor, right? It attracts these initial conditions. So that's why it's really, it's, it's really nice because it tells you that it's feasible. Like when we got mutual, we did, we, that, when that rule didn't, was violated before with the R star and P star rules, a coexistence equilibrium was not feasible because these boundaries were stable, right? So the, well, the other interesting thing, mathematically speaking, is the, the stability of this boundary equilibrium, the eigenvalue that determines the stability of this boundary equilibrium, if you switch the sign, is the per capita growth rate of the other species when it's rare. We see that. If that didn't make you any sense, do not worry. Right. So the stability then is, once we establish there is one, we have to then show that that equilibrium is stable to small perturbations, meaning if you sent it here, it should be able to recover. But it's only small. There's a domain of attraction. And that domain, I just drew it here. That's the only region of the state space. So these are state variables, so we call this the state space. State space is that region that can attract. So it's a generally a small perturbation for because I'm sure you've learned the stability analysis, right? Because we linearize near the equilibrium. So you approximate that curve, you know, the cur curve with a line and we kind of squint and say, oh, that works. But it works in the neighborhood, right? So if you have a curve like this, that's your real function, and you draw a tangent, right? It only touches at one point, but around that neighborhood, it kind of approximates the curve. That's the whole point. But you go away, it doesn't work anymore, right? That's the thing with, so you have to be very careful when you linearize things. You know, ultimately everything is linearized. That's the thing. You go through all these things and then we say, let's ignore all the higher order terms and just take it, right? But this is important to know why you do those things. Right. So we are going to do the mutual invisibility analysis to determine the feasibility and the local stability analysis to determine whether that internal equilibrium is stable. I've written out a lot of this stuff like this so that when you have the notes, I mean, these are the kinds of notes I wish I had when I was your age. So you could teach from it one day, right? So like, that's why I, like, if it seems redundant, it's because you're gonna look at this 
from three months, I'm like, I have no idea what she said, right? So that's why if it's redundant, it's because I summarize frequently so you can follow better. Right, so we know we have to determine, quantify the invasion criteria. Now with the three species model, you can't just look at the equation for consumer one or consumer two and say I get the item, you, I get the innovation criteria. You have to now get it through uh, eigenvalue analysis because it's a three by three dimensional system. The minute you go away from two dimensional systems, things get a bit complicated. So what we do is we construct the Jacobian matrix, which is basically interaction coefficients, right? You have interaction coefficients. So everybody has gone through that already in the course. Have you constructed a Jacob, maybe it was called something else. A Jacobian matrix and kind of, so you kind of know that for like a two by two, right? So now we just do it for a three by three and we evaluate that Jacobian, remember when we just had the innovation criteria, what we wrote it out, we evaluated it at the competitor's equilibrium, right? In the same way, he, we just evaluate it at these respective boundary equilibria. Why do we call these boundary? Because they are at the boundary of the state space that's an interior equilibrium. These are just terms, okay? All right, everybody happy so far? Right, so that's the Jacobian. How do you get that? Each of those terms is the partial derivative of the appropriate species equation uh, with respect to the appropriate state variable. So that very first one is if we say, so that's dr, dr over dt, right? Let's just say that's f, and then the dc1, let's say that's g. So that very first term is delta, the partial derivative of the right-hand side of that equation with respect to r. What is that telling you? That's really important, that's just not some quiggly symbol, symbol courtesy of Isaac Newton and Leibniz. It's actually telling you that species effect on itself, right? That's so, if you look at these diagonal terms, that's, those are the each species effects on themselves, right? Do you follow? Because the diagonal is like A11, so this is, if you have a matrix like this, I'm just gonna do silly things like this. This is what? That's A11, right? A12, A13, a21, A22, A23, etc. right? So we keep doing that, but here are the things too. So these negative terms are because the resource is detrimented by, the resource is harmed by consumption by the two consumers. But then on the other hand, look at these positive terms. These positive terms are the, resource, the benefit the resource confers on each of the consumers, right? So you know this system, right? So the resource is harmed by the two consumers because it's, it's taken away. It's, it's, been, um, ex, it's been exploited, like if it's a prey species, it gets eaten. So obviously the resource suffers harm, but it confers a benefit. And the matrix actually, if you think about it, it's a beautiful visualization of all those interactions encapsulated in this little thing. This is where like if you feel like, uh, gosh, I, I get drowned in these symbols and I is hopeless, I'm never going, just think of it as a kind of a landscape where you're looking at these species interactions and the complexity is kind of, you know, um, represented in this sparse way, right? It's a code for all that complexity, right? So in any of these matrices, this, this is self-limitation. And off diagonal are then each species effect on one of the other species. We have three because there's the uh, consumer one's effect on consumer two, consumer two's effect on consumer one, so you have three, right? You could have many. So do you feel more comfortable with that then? And then, but see, if this were a two by two, you wouldn't have these, but look at this. Now, this is the effect of, so this is, uh, no, sorry, here, focus on this. Here, see, you see that there's an extra negative term for the Ig prey because it's preyed on by, preyed upon by the Ig predator, right? So it actually acts as a resource for the Ig predator, right? 
And that translates into a benefit. So here's, just like the resource benefits the consumers, but is harmed by it, the IG prey benefits the IG predator, but is harmed by it. So what you want to do is, you want to go home, look at that thing and try to visualize, right? And it's actually good to try to work through this um, because I'm, you know, I don't really have the time to like for you to, uh, to take the partial derivatives, but if you just work through it, don't even bother about like, if it's like, okay, I forget how to take a partial derivative. It's not what the, that's the outcome, right? It's what it represents that I want you to understand. A species effect on itself versus its effect on another species versus those species effect on itself, right? There are three things going on. So above the diagonal, below the diagonal, just then you can maybe even like a draw a picture for yourself. Here's what the IG prey does to the IG predator. It's a kind of like an impressionistic thing of this whole dynamical landscape. If you think about it that way, it doesn't seem like, oh my gosh, I'm, you know, this is just such a terrible thing to have to go through, right? And plus, taking a partial derivative with this stuff is not that hard because most terms are linear. So, you know, like it's like it becomes constant or at most you will have to do the, uh, the product rule or the quotient rule. So, and you can look these up. There are programs now that would do that for you. If you, you know, if you're like, oh, I don't really have to know that part. I want to know what comes out of it. You can also do that. Okay. Now then what you want to do is the first step is to construct the Jacobian. So here's your recipe. I've got the recipe here, okay? Now we have that. We want to now evaluate it at the approximate, the appropriate boundary equilibrium. So the boundary equilibrium with the resource and IG prey is that one. Of course, IG prey is zero. This is the boundary equilibrium for the resource and consumer two, which is the IG predator. So let's, so what we do is we evaluate the, here's a, another one of those summary slides. Evaluate the Jacobian at the boundary equilibrium for resource. So no, sorry, we are going to compute, I can't see because there's me on that corner. Uh, <laughs> compute the invasion criterion for, so we're doing the invasion criterion for IG predator. Okay, I should be looking at my screen. So three steps, we evaluate the Jacobian at the boundary equilibrium with the resource and consumer one, because we want to know whether the IG predator can increase when it's out in small numbers, while the IG prey and the resource are at equilibrium. Now, why do we want to do that? Because that equilibrium is the environment, the biotic environment the IG predator faces when it's rare, right? So forget about all equilibrium stuff. What you're really doing is what is the environment, the, in, the invading species, the species that's rare, faces when, it's in, when it is at a disadvantage and its competitor is an ad, at an advantage. Mathematically, is that equilibrium. So this is just a mathematical representation, representation of the biological reality that there is a worst case scenario for any species coming into a community, which is that it's very rare and while its competitor is doing as well as it can, okay? Then, we just go through the, now this becomes a recipe, right? You go through and you compute the eigenvalues of the matrix, the Jacobian matrix, and you find the dominant eigenvalue of that Jacobian because that happens to be the per capita growth rate of consumer two, when it's rare, consumer two being the IG predator, when it's rare and consumer one is abundant, okay? If the dominant eigenvalue is positive, that boundary equilibrium is unstable. So, so tell me why, an why we say an equilibrium is stable when the eigenvalue, the dominant eigenvalue is negative. There's a very good, anybody? Uh, it's in that picture. Oh, you're suddenly on the spot. No, no, no I, I guess. Um, could you repeat? Okay, so, <laughs> so I am saying here, I'm making a claim here. If the dominant eigenvalue is positive, the boundary equilibrium with the resource and consumer one is unstable, right? That oh. means that can be invaded by something, right? So then the counterpoint must be that that equilibrium is stable when the dominant eigenvalue is negative. What's that telling you? 
There is hint, you answer the stability analysis. Hint, 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 hint. That it's an attractor. It's an attractor okay. because it, it's negative means all these perturbations get dampened out. Did you have a lecture on that, by the way? Yeah, hey, go back to my lecture. So remember, you do the little d, the perturb equation for the perturbation. You did you do this? Equation for the perturbation. And then you say that it's, a, it's like a negative exponential, right? It just decays. So if the Nigan value is negative, that equilibrium is stable. IG predator can never invade. We are looking to find whether that whether there's any condition under which that eigenvalue could become positive, because that's the condition for the, so it has to be true, right? If this equilibrium is unstable, that means a species can invade when rare. If it's stable, then no species can invade that equilibrium. So if the dominant eigenvalue is positive, then IG Pareto has a positive per capita growth rate when it's rare and can invade a community of the resource and consumer. Now that's all we know, right? Because this is telling you it's feasible, right? So let's calculate this thing. So here's the Jacobian again for the umpteen time. Now we evaluate it at the boundary equilibrium. You can see magically a lot of stuff has gone away and it's a lot more simple. Well, I mean for a three C species system, it's simple. Uh, and here is some, um, will be from linear algebra, the eigenvalues of the Jacobian, uh, we get them from the, as the roots of the characteristic equation. And this is a cubic, why? Because the dimensions of the characteristic equation correspond to the dimensions of your ecological system. We have three species, so we have three eigenvalues. What is the dominant eigenvalue? It's the one that has the largest absolute value. So it is dominant, it dominates, behavior dominates. It describes the dominant behavior of the system, okay? So that's just some background linear algebra. It's not like the biggest positive value or, you know, because it actually flips back and forth. So it's the largest absolute value. So here is the dominant eigenvalue of the Jacobian evaluated at the boundary equilibrium with the resource and consumer one. This is now the per capita growth rate of consumer two when it's rare. Now you can see there is a term that talks about resource competition there. Look at this. Think about this. This part is like the R star rule, right? Because we took out the E because we non-dimensionalized it. So this A now has the E inside it. This is exactly like the R star part. If you just can flip back to your notes from yesterday, you'll see this. That's all we had yesterday. But now we have this term. And what is this? What do you, what do you, what can you say about this quantity? So this thing has to be positive, right? What is that, A1 minus D1? Exactly the yes, like the birth rate minus the death rate. So for the, pre so you see how much mystery is, it's not mystery, what I'm saying is how much information is there if you look at this thing carefully, right? Because that has to be positive, right? Because otherwise the IG prey cannot itself persist. So if you apply the persistence criterion for the IG prey, any time it's not surviving, then that obviously, you can't feed on something that's going extinct. Although you can until it goes extinct, right? So there's a lot that you can understand. I mean, this is just like a bunch of, like it's a bunch of, like of symbols, right? But it's the trick about these things is, you look at it with your question in mind and you try to identify little things like that. Okay, what does that mean? Why is there a minus sign there? And sometimes you see, like I found things by just actually taking the time to think, where other people have gone for 75 years without actually appreciating, because it's not that I'm great, it's just that I took the time to look at it. A lot of people just like, okay, well I just need to show that's positive. That's also because if you, you have more of a mathematician's mind. But if you want to be a biologist, you want to actually identify the conditions under which this happens. So somebody could go out and test this, for example, or design an experiment, right? See, that's the thing where if you're a mathematical biologist or biomathematician, you want to be the kind of person who makes models that make testable predictions. You have to be able to, it could be as elegant as it can be, so that's a fairly elegant model, but it actually says something that you can use, right? That's that best science that I talked about. Very good biology and good mathematics. If you do something like prove a theorem, you can, 
but it's not very useful, right? You can prove a theorem for just for yourself, but you also need to come go the next step. All right. So we know that this is then has to be true. We have to work that out, but then let's also do the same thing for IG prey. So I'm not going to go through the details. You evaluate the Jacobian for the appropriate boundary equilibrium, compute the eigenvalues, find the dominant eigenvalue, and you get this. Okay. So again, like you can see that they are that good terms. So there are parallels in this thing. Okay. So it's nice to look at them, you know, side by side. So basically, this is um, you can have this thing. So we are cal we are looking at mutual invisibility now. Oh, here. So now you can look at them, actually, in the same graph. So you know that mutual invisibility requires that both of these are satisfied. Now we have to work out. So remember, if you remember from yesterday, we just had this part yesterday, right? And if we found out those are mutually exclusive, right? You can't say it, but now we've got to deal with this part. So we actually, now we have to think about this. Now the mathematics part is kind of over in the sense that now we need to work out, does this work? How does it work? So we know like you have to, but when does it become positive is the thing, right? Okay, so our hypothesis, the starting hypothesis for this was that one, if one species is a superior competitor for a common resource with a lower R star, but is more susceptible to a common natural enemy, maybe coexistence would be possible, right? That's what we started out with. That was our idea for this mechanism. So here we have the two consumers competing for a common resource. They also engage in this kind of trophic interaction. Consumer one is susceptible to predation by consumer two. Cons but so that, okay, so think about this. The IG prey has an overall disadvantage, right? It gets eaten by its competitor. That's two negative things, right? What's the only thing it can do to counteract these negative effects? It's got to be a really good competitor for the basal resource, right? Right, you see? Because it's a kind of this asymmetric interaction. The IG pet has two things to get nutrition from. It can attack the resource, but it can also attack its competitor. That's a huge advantage, right? Is there any situation under which the IG prey is sort of like the underdog here can alleviate that situation and coexist, and that's if it is a, it's got to be a superior competitor. Do you see? On, in this scenario, that's the only possibility. So, how do we determine the competitive superiority? We already know this. We use the R star rule, right? We did this already. So here are the R stars. So we are now just looking at the resource competition in the non-dimensional. Yesterday we had D1 over E1, A1, right? But this is now a non-dimensional system. So here. If the IG prey is the superior resource competitor, it should have a lower R star, right? So RC1 star should be lower than RC2 star. Uh, unfortunately, I have given the, why is there a less than one on the other side? Why is there an upper constraint there? Normalized by K. Exactly. It's normalized by K, right? So the IG predator cannot have an R star bigger than K, right? So there is an upper constraint. That's, so to be very correct, you, to be rigorous, you write down all the conditions, although we don't necessarily, that's implied, you could say, but it's actually important to remember, right? So then, for that to be true, this has to be true, and from that, you get that condition, and we know that for each species to persist, this is the, that, that term with the minus sign, right? Remember A1 minus D1 and A2? So you see that in order for each of these things to persist on the resource, that has to be true. This really helps us, right? There are three things. But this, have we having to be positive is really helpful. So, look, what we have is here that because if the IG prey is the superior competitor, this term is positive, right? It has the lower R star, and for the IG predator then, 
that term has to be negative, right? This is exactly the R star thing we did yesterday, right? Agree? If it's, and there's no interpretation now. If it's just resource competition and the IG praise the superior resource competitor with the lower R star, it's going to win, right? But we have then two things going on there that gives the IG predator, give the IG predator an advantage. So what happens is that we can conclude then if the IG prey can invade when rare, going back to this equation and writing it. So I have this inequality written like this and then I rewrite it like this because it makes it very clear. If it's the gain, to the IG prey can invade when rare, if the gain from resource competition, it's for competitive superiority in exploiting the resource outweighs the harm it suffers from intragripidation. Quite intuitive, right? But of course, in order for that to work, these parameters have to take certain kinds of values, right? And the IG predator can invade when rare. If the benefit it accrues from intragripidation outweighs the, its in inferiority in resource competition. Do you see? So basically these equations are saying, if this is true, if these Four things, if these two inequalities are mapped, then you can have coexistence. Are we saying there is coexistence? No, we are saying if this were true, then you would get, that's the whole point, right? We are establishing the criteria for feasibility, right? Everybody understand? So I know that there's a lot of algebra here. It's not what matters so much, it's how you go about this question, okay? So I always tell my students, you're not going to understand everything, but it would be nice to go home if you can today or this afternoon at some point, look at your notes and make some, you know, so, so make your own like notes. She said this or the other thing so that when you want to look at it sometime later, you kind of remember, okay? Or write it down now, okay? But it's a, it's a nice kind of a, these notes give you kind of basically for you to work this out on your own with examples, okay? All right, so basically then we get mutually in, Mutual invisibility via this intraspecific trade off between resource competition and intragripidation. So here's where a trade off is giving you mutual invisibility. If both species are equal competitors, the IG predator has the overall advantage and will exclude the IG prey because they are the same in competition, but the IG prey eats the IG predator eats the IG prey. If the IG prey is the inferior competitor as well, well, it has no future, right? No tomorrow, it's going to get excluded very quickly. So mutual invasivity can happen if and only if the IG prey is a superior resource competitor. So we've seen, we've, we've analyzed in great detail the conditions for mutual invasivity. Invasibility, what tells us, what it tells us is, oh my gosh, What is that? Mm. Okay, so I lost something here. Oh, here. Mm. This morning I had the brilliant idea of not being the big cord because it was heavy. Didn't bargain for. Okay. So now we need to establish this, right? Given that it's feasible, it's a stable too, but small perturbations, right? So you can, because it, yes. Wait, but didn't you just, could, could you go back a little bit? That mean that there is no mutual invisibility, invisibility. There is mutual invisibility if these inequalities are satisfied. So it depends on the parameters. Yes. They can't happen at the same time. Oh, they can. No, they can't. So this yeah, doesn't sorry. have mutual. No, no, so you would if you mm -hmm. just had that, right? But these things actually make the difference. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You see, this and this now have altered the landscape completely. That's the fun part, okay? Good, good. Any question, just stop me, please, okay? So, okay. So now, actually, you can sit down and calculate these things. The coexistence equation. We already know it's feasible. And if you now look very carefully, look at this. Does this look familiar to you? Does this look familiar to you? That's the invasion criteria. So the numerator of the equilibrium 
Look how beautiful that is. That's where you kind of want to be a math nerd. Look, see, that came in there, right? So that has to be positive. So what, this is positive, so what guarantees the positivity of uh, the IG praise equilibrium? This thing has to be positive, right? This is already telling you something significant. Do you see that? For this to have meaning, all numerators, sorry, all denominators have to be non-negative, right? And actually not zero, right? Otherwise you'll have undefined. So they have to be positive. No, sorry, not non-negative, they have to be positive. And, but then if you look at the numerator, we already know that's positive, right? Because that's the invasion criterion. Do you see? Things come together really well. That's the beauty of this. In words, we couldn't have done that, okay? So if you go through and like do this for yourself or you look at the notes, you will see how those things you prepared. All of these are now back here. All right, so now, not stuck again. Right, so question. Somebody had a question. So the mutual invisibility criteria guarantees us that the numerator is positive, but we still don't have information about the denominator, right? Yes, we don't, and we are gonna get there, okay? But they are tied in, so now you will see. Wait, wait, wait. This is like, like oh, suspense shows. You have to wait for like, what's gonna happen? That's when my son actually takes the remote or he sits on it. Like, just when like, oh, somebody's gonna get killed or the ghost comes from somewhere. Okay, there. So now here's the Jacobian matrix for the three species community. We haven't substituted for the null equilibria, but now you notice the diagonal. Now here, this actually gives you a lot of information. The diagonal terms are zero except for the resource. Why is that? Self-limitation. There is no carrying capacity for the consumers. There is no self-limitation in the consumers. There's only self, because they are regulated by the resource, right? If you, they had, they, they can't have their own self-limitation if they are dependent on this resource. So that beautifully is, ca is beautifully captured in the Jacobian, right? They went away. Whatever that long term we had before, they've gone away, right? So, and then here, now comes the fun part. So this is, uh, we saw this, so they have these three roots, and A1 happens to be R star, that's easy. Right? So if you work this out, A1 happens to be R star. A2 is this thing, and A3 is this thing. Okay, what do we do with that? It's a bit hard. We have something magical called Ruth Hurwitz criteria for the stability of the coexistence equilibrium. This allows us to not take a shortcut. Without calculating the eigenvalues, we simply use the coefficients of the characteristic equation, and there are conditions, these criteria. If the criteria are satisfied, it's equivalent to showing that the eigenvalue, dominant eigenvalue is negative, because we are now looking at stability of this coexistence equilibrium, right? So the criteria are that A1 is positive, A3 is positive, and that thing called A1, A2 minus A3 is positive. Now by inspection, we can already see that A1 and A2 are positive, because these are all positive quantities, right? Do you see a negative sign anywhere? I hate when, it's, when there's a negative sign. There is no negative sign, good. So, A3 is the tricky one. A3 is positive only if this thing is negative. Okay, now think about this. If F is greater than one, then this quantity is negative you're subtracting a positive quantity from a negative quantity, this is always satisfied, right? But what does that say though? What does F larger than one say? The gain to the IG predator from integral predation is greater than the gain to the IG prey from resource competition. Yeah, isn't that beautiful? Like it's saying something really important. That's the condition for it to work, that it has to get enough nutrition. In other words, so it has a resource, right? So this is like a herbivore, I don't know, it's hard to imagine like buffalo eating, I don't know, some other big herbivore or something. But anyway, come up with a good example. But basically it's saying that it's not worthwhile for the Ig predator unless this Ig prey yields enough nutrition, right? 
because otherwise you're just eating less nutritious food. So the benefit has to be strong, you know, strong enough for this to be, for the Ig predator to be able to persist by feeding partly on the Ig prey and feeding partly on the resource. If it were not, if it's not nutritious enough, natural selection would tell you that it would be much better, it would have higher effectiveness by just focusing on resource competition, right? So if the resource were more nutritious than your competitor, yes? Just to be sure I understand everything, like the whole picture. Uh, in the previous topic, we saw that in order for the Ig prey to survive and we have the coexistence, the prey needs to be a better compe competitor, for the a competitor for the resource. And now we are looking that in order for this coexistence to persist, we need the predator to acquire more energy, be more efficient by predating the prey than the resource. Right. Did That's I understand yeah. correctly? It doesn't say anything about how good the IG prey is. Basically, it's saying, see, so what it's saying is that whatever gain, so whatever the IG prey gains from being the superior competitor, the benefit to the IG predator of eating the IG prey has to be greater because otherwise it would make more sense for you to just feed on the resource. Okay, that's what it's saying. Yeah, there's no resource partitioning is what it's saying actually. So it's a bit more subtle than just about the mathematics show because it's saying that this is a very good question. So it says that if you just look at the equation and translate it, this is what it's saying, right? Now we have to scratch our heads a little bit. But it's all it's saying is whatever that the Ig prey gets from its resource, the Ig, so because see, if it were not true, if the Ig prey gets more, Ig prey should do the same thing. It should go to the resource, right? Because if the Ig prey is getting so much benefit and the Ig prey is eating Ig prey instead of feeding on the resource is actually getting less nutrition, less energy per capita, right? So that's what it's saying. Saying that this benefit has to be worthwhile for the Ig predator to keep preying on the Ig prey. Okay, and why there's that coexistence? Why is that important for coexistence? The stability we will come into in the next couple of slides, okay? This is a very good question, it's a very good question. Because see, like this is the de defining criterion here, yes? I just, I'm sorry, I just wanted to be reminded, uh, these are the normalized, non-dimensional, mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to remember what F yeah, Exactly, that's for. where I'm going. You're always anticipating my slide. <laughs> now, wait, just, uh, so, and this one is easy. A1, A2 minus A3 happens to blessedly have all positive signs with all positive cons. So we really are, this is the defining one, right? Now. So these are all the things together, right? That's all the, all the criteria, just in one page. Now, coexistence equilibrium is stable. So that is telling us the mathematics of it. We need to understand this in terms, in biological terms. So there are two criteria that have to be met, right? Ig prey should be superior in resource competition means it has to have a high attack rate and a low death rate. Consumer two should gain sufficient benefit from preying on consumer one, that means high alpha and F, okay? So you can get, now we see, if you went out and measured, you'd be able to actually quantify these things, right? For these, like I did that for my insect system with the parasitoid. So you do have this, so you see that this interspecific trade-off is necessary for coexistence, right? Now, because that's the only way those conditions are satisfied if you go back and work on that. So, wait, wait, I did have, where's the, I, I missed a slide somewhere. How is that possible? I was going to ask you a question about the F. Okay, let me go back to, let's go back to F. Sorry, I had to go back all the way to the non-dimensional isolation. Oh, 
Oh. There. What is f larger than 1? Work it out, work it out and tell me. You have been pen and paper. This is f hat, by the way. That was f hat, remember? So what's f larger than 1? What does f have to be? Tell me. Say, do it. It's just little algebra. Larger than E1 over E2. Exactly. F has to be larger than E1 over E2, right? So that's exactly what the thing was saying before, right? That the benefit that it gets has to be greater than the benefit that the, I mean, you have to be able to do that. Like you're making me do that anyway. So somewhere I, I have this slide and I have dropped it or something. Anyway, so that's the thing. That's, so that's very key. Um, the question you asked, that's really key, right? So because uh, that's what it says here. Uh, so here. F is greater than one when these words actually then come from the action. <laughs> because okay, this is F hat, right? So now we do the, the backflip thing. Now we put a hat on and say, well, remember actual F is somewhere inside it, right? This, is in, this infuriates people. I don't know why, I don't have a problem. But, well, you do have a problem if somebody reviews your paper and say, I do not like what you're doing. So anyway, so there it is. So now I'm gonna summarize, because I really wanna get to spatial stuff. <coughs> so to summarize, oh my gosh, we still have to do relative non-linearity. Um, so interspecific trade-off leading to this partitioning of resource and a or a natural enemy. And that was our starting point. We looked at this particular example, which is a very interesting and unique biological interaction. And we find that this interspecific, just as I said, the interspecific trade-off between competition and predation generates the negative feedback necessary for coexistence. That's why we had feasibility. It's a IG prey is the superior competitor, but the IG prey can consume the prey. So, uh, so the IG, prey, IG predator can consume the prey. That's local niche partitioning. How is this niche partitioning? The IG prey has one resource. The IG predator has two resources, so it's actually dividing. So that means the negative effect on the IG prey is ameliorated to some, sorry, the negative effect uh, of competition that two species, the, both species would face in the absence of intra predation is ameliorated because part of the time the IG predator is not attacking the resource but attacking the IG prey. Now, but remember, in order for the IG prey to survive, it has to be able to get enough nutrition. So it's a very, so in practice, this mechanism is a little too restrictive. You can see, right, there are so many things stacked against the IG prey, right? So it works, but the conditions are fairly narrow. So if you look at the empirical papers, almost always there has to be something else to augment it, okay? Because you can see that the IG prey is basically, odds are stacked against it, right? So, but this is the thing, this resource partitioning is what generates stronger intraspecific competition, uh, interactions relative to interspecific interactions, which is the key requirement for coexistence. Okay, now let's do nonlinearity and go to lunch. This is shorter. I sent, when I sent the reading list, a paper by Armstrong and McGehee, you should read that one uh, as some background. And also Twitter Chesson's uh, annual reviews 2000 paper, you know that behemoth for like a citation classic, I don't know, 25,000 citations or something. I made that up, okay. So coexistence by nonlinearity, we are going back to our favorite example of exploitative competition. Oh, um, that's just the indirect, the arrows there are not interrogation, that's just the indirect competition thing, okay? We are going back to our equation with, so we started off with this yesterday, with type one functional responses, linear functional responses, and we found that under those conditions, there was no coexistence because the R star rule operated, the consumer that depresses the resource abundance to the lowest level, always won, right? We did this already, right? Now we are going to ask this question about what if the functional responses are nonlinear? We already saw this yesterday, right? The nonlinear functional responses generate all kinds of really interesting 
dynamics can coexist and then occur via this mechanism called relative nonlinearity. And what that means, of course, uh, is okay, so relative nonlinearity. Let me explain that the functional responses we are interested in is the type two, which you are an expert in now, having seen this yesterday. But the thing is, it's, it's a very biologically prevalent. Almost all organisms have this. And you can say, well, that's not optimal. Yes, but there is a constraint, right? You have a limited gut capacity, you have a limited number of eggs, so it's a constraint. Yes, natural selection would say, uh, you know, according to natural selection, there should be an optimal one there, but you can't. You can't, like an insect cannot get bigger than it is. Your gut cannot be bigger than it is given your design constraints, right? So, so, we, so we've seen this already, what it does. Now we have this set of equations where the only difference is that they have now type two functional responses. Now, how, does, how do consumers differ in the degree of nonlinearity in their functional responses? In the two, they do through these two parameters in the functional response, attack rate and handling time, right? So, if you have a higher attack rate and a longer handling time, you get a more nonlinear functional response. You can plot this too for yourself. Here's what I've done here. So, here, is resource density on the x-axis, the functional response on the y-axis. Consumer one has a higher attack rate and a longer handling time. It has a more nonlinear functional response. It saturates much earlier. So it's not a very good consumer at controlling the resource. You can see that right away, right? But if you look at the consumer two, which has a lower attack rate, so actually not getting per capita as many prey items, but it also has a shorter handling time. Right? It, it, it processes them very quickly. It, it's slow to get them, but then once you get, and that one has a less nonlinear functional response. What does that tell you? It can keep exploiting the resource until it gets really high, right? So that's a kind of an advantage. We don't yet, yet know what that, whether that is an advantage. It looks like it. And then you remember this, this is the per capita growth rate of the resource, the longer the handling time, the more nonlinear the functional response, and stronger this positive part of the curve, and more likely that you will get very strong consumer resource oscillations, okay? So let's just look at consumer resource dynamics when each species persists in isolation with the resource, so the pairwise. So this is the thing I said to do yesterday. Look at the time series. The time series are really interesting. So here, so this is consumer one with the more nonlinear functional response. Time, these are just time series. This is consumer two with the, sorry, this is the more nonlinear, this is the less nonlinear, okay? Now look, when the functional response is really nonlinear, very nonlinear, they persist in a limit cycle. So they're oscillating indefinitely. This actually says, well, settles into a stable limit cycle. It generates, the more important point is the consumer with the more nonlinear function response generates fluctuations in resource abundance. If you look at this consumer with the less nonlinear function response, the oscillations are damped and the system stabilizes to System, uh, oscillations are damped and the system exists in what's called a stable focus, which is a stable equilibrium, point equilibrium, approach to via damped oscillations. So you can see the pairwise interactions show qualitatively very different dynamics, okay? Right, and this is from Armstrong, this is based on Armstrong and McGehee 1980. That's the paper you want to be uh, reading if you want to see a uh, you know, more mathematical uh, treatment of this. So the thing is, if, since the consumer one has the higher attack rate, if the functional response were linear, the R star rule will operate and consumer one would exclude consumer two, right? We agree on that. If you have the higher attack rate because there's no handling time and the functional response is linear, whichever species has the higher attack rate is going to reduce the resource to the lower level, it's going to win in competition. But when consumers have nonlinear functional responses, the species with the more nonlinear functional response generates fluctuations in resource abundance. So now, if the 
average resource abundance over the duration of one of these cycles exceeds <coughs> the R star of the second consumer, then it can invade. Do you see the beauty of this? So in a constant, when you have a type one functional response, the resource abundance is constant because the system goes to a stable equilibrium. But when the sy system, you know this, right? It's kind of a concave down thing, so on average. So basically, if these fluctuations are strong enough that the resource abundance averaged over one cycle period exceeds the R star of the consumer with the less nonlinear functional response, it can invade when rare. Because what do you need if you have the if you have a disadvantage? So the, the species with the more nonlinear functional response has a higher attack rate, right? So the one with the less nonlinear functional response has a lower attack rate. So you know, without the handling time part, that means the second species is actually a, an inferior competitor. In order to persist, the resource abundance has to exceed its R star, right? In, so when it's entering the system, in order for it to increase when rare, the resource abundance has to exceed its R star, right? Because the R star is the resource abundance at which it can maintain itself. So do you agree? For any species to increase when rare, the resource abundance has to be above its R star so it can reproduce in excess of mortality, right? So that's where this comes in, this mechanism. The beauty of this mechanism is that the fluctuations generate in the resource generated by the species with the more nonlinear functional response, if those fluctuations are such that on average, the resource abundance now exceeds the R star of the species with the less nonlinear functional response, that species can invade when rare. I can't even believe that I got that sentence together. But you see, like it's, uh, but that's the whole point of it, okay? All right, but here's the thing, coexistence, this is, this is really actually quite an interesting mechanism. Coexistence occurs via a very subtle form of resource partitioning, not what we think is usually as resource partitioning. So cons the consumer, you know, what, when you have a very nonlinear functional response, what, do, what, what generates oscillations? It's because the consumer is really bad at controlling the resource when it's highly abundant, right? But it's quite good at uh, exploiting the resource when resource abundance is low. So the consumer with the more nonlinear functional response is better at resource exploitation when resource abundance is low. But the consumer, with, but then because it has a nonlinear functional response, it generates these oscillations, and the oscillations have a peak and a trough, right? That's the thing about the oscillations. They have a maximum and a minimum. So when there is such variability in abundances, the consumer with the less nonlinear functional response can, is better, can be better at resource exploitation when resource abundance is high because it has a lower attack rate. It needs a lot of resource to get there. So you, do you see, without much mathematics, we can actually intuitively understand what's going here, on here. So the one, uh, to repeat, okay, what's there? So basically what happens is the resource partitioning is that the two consumers exploit different parts of the same resource cycle. The sep so this separation so is like this. Oh, I'm allergic to chalk actually. Hopefully the mask will protect me. Okay. So here are the, res you know, here's the resource abundance. Right? So around here, who does well? Consumer one, because it has the more nonlinear functional response, but it has a higher attack rate, remember? So it can actually exploit the resource when the resource is not very abundant, and it gets hopelessly bad when the resource abundance is high because its attack rate, the functional response becomes constant, right? So it's underexploits the resource, and that's why you have the Oscillation. So this is consumer one, and then consumer two is here. So you see, since oscillations occur over time, so dynamics are, this is over time, right? When you have a resource species fluctuating, that's over time. It's low in, at some point, it's high at some point. So they actually is a sort of a temporal partitioning of the resource because they use different parts of the resource cycle. Isn't that great? 
Like it's just like such an interesting mechanism, right? They are utilizing different parts of this oscillatory dynamic. And then that means species one is interacting more with members of its own species. Species two is interacting with members of its own species. So there are stronger intraspecific interactions relative to interspecific interactions, which is what we need for coexistence. Right? They're so they are competing more, strong, more strongly with their own species when they are exploiting different parts of the cycle. That increases intraspecific competition, but they are separated in time. The two species are separated in time. Their overlap is minimum. So interspecific competition then is weaker than intraspecific competition. Okay? So there, we've, we've come up with, we've looked at two mechanisms of coexistence that occur via nonlinear dynamics operating within an isolated community, local community, in the absence of any environmental variation. So how is it even possible? It's possible because this negative feedbacks arising from these species interactions enable stronger interspecific competition, and they happen in two distinctive ways, right? In the first case, oops, uh, that was on the last time. <laughs> we had a discussion about what a mechanism was. So in the first case, you had this trade-off thing. Species are d good at different things, right? And the second one is not whether they are better at something or worse at something. It's just that their ability to find and handle a resource is different, right? So one species could find resources really easily, but takes a long time to handle them. And that uh, generates a more nonlinear functional response. And other species have um, very low search rate. So, but once they find the prey, they can very quickly process them, right? And then you get a more, less nonlinear or more linear functional response. That difference, if it's sufficient, so of course now here is the thing, that difference in nonlinearity has to be sufficient such that there is enough separation in the resource cycle. And then you can get coexistence, okay? So that's, uh, that's this idea and we are right on time and that means that I've taken two lectures to go through this, but I assume that You'd rather learn something well than learn a lot of things not well, right? Yes. Uh, I remember from last class that uh, the negative feedback was a density dependent um, process. Yeah, so this negative feedback is density dependent. And that being defined as the per capita growth rate being yeah. a de in this case a neg decreasing functional density. Okay, and I remember as well that uh, you said that the functional response is a positive feedback. Functional response itself generates a positive feedback. But remember in our equations we had resource self-limitation also. So now we have a tension between the um, positive feedback and the negative feedback. With a high handling time and a high attack rate, for the consumer one, the first species, the positive feedback part is bigger than the negative feedback part. For the second species, so the per capita, if you look at the per capita growth rate, that's a very good question. So the per capita growth rate of the, remember, this is manifested in the resource, right? So the per capita growth rate of the resource sort of looks like this, right? This is the positive feedback, this is the negative feedback, right? For that first consumer, the positive feedback part is like this because it has a more nonlinear functional response. For the other species, it will be like this, right? There, right there, you see the difference. But it's this tension, there's more tension here between positive and negative feedback, and it's the negative feedback is not strong enough to dampen the initial oscillations, right? is the rising part, right? Because it's saying the per capita growth rate increases with increasing density. See, the logistic, for example, if you just had the logistic model, remember, it's like that. 
right? Because the per capita growth rate decreases with increasing density. That means but the difference between births and deaths decreases with increasing density because as density increases, you have fewer resources, fewer births, more deaths, right? And the thing with this is when you have a handling time, the consumer is slow to respond to resource abundance. So the resource has this escape phase where it's actually increasing with because nothing is controlling it. But once the resource reaches a certain point when it is limited by its own limiting factors, then the negative density, the self-limitation kicks in and it starts to go out. So this part, how big this slope is, how, how the, the critical resource density at which there you have this transition, it depends on the handling time and the attack rates because it's A times H is a very interesting thing. If you look at it, it's this product, okay? A times H, attack rate times the handling time. But without handling time, you wouldn't get nonlinearity. But once you have a handling time, if you have a higher attack rate and a longer handling time, then that term is really large, right? The nonlinearity, it's like a one over X function, right? It's something like one over A plus X kind of function. So uh, the coefficient is really large on the X. Well, my, my other question is about the differences between the resource partitioning in the first mechanism mm -hmm. and in the second. Uh, I understand that you said that both, both mechanisms uh, affect resource partitioning between these so species. So they are very different. In the first one, one of the competitors has two resources. It's the resource itself and its competitor. So you know, when you can't get the resource, you also eat your competitor. And if that's nutritious enough, you can actually persist. In the second one, you have just one resource, right? You just have this resource. But if a consumer exploits that resource in a way such that it becomes very poor at controlling the resource when the resource is abundant, then you get these oscillations. Because basically, the resource has no control until it becomes very, um, high density, right? The thing is, when that positive feedback thing is large, the system has this tension between this part and this part, and if this is really large, have you ever seen, like you should try a model with no density dependence, no negative density, no logistic growth in the resource, and just the type two function response, it blows up. It, it leads to divergent oscillations, right? When you have negative feedback in the resource, it actually converts those into something more periodic and more, you know, basically like a limit cycle. If the positive feedback is really large, it still can be go away from a limit cycle to something aperiodic. It gets, a, you know, messy, right? So that positive feedback can actually generate a lot of complexity in the dynamic. Uh, so if you have a species that generates these fluctuations, and those fluctuations are such that the, on average, the abundance is now higher. That is what allows the second species to come in and utilize the portions of those fluctuations where the resource abundance is high. Because remember, the first one is really bad at controlling the resource, but if you have a linear functional response, that means no matter how high the resource is, you know, generally, you know, the less nonlinear means you still keep you utilizing the resource. You don't max out like the other one. Okay, so that's, so they're very different. In the first one, you actually have two resources for the, one of the competitors. The second one, the resource, in fact, there's no environmental variation, right? This is just intrinsic oscillation. The species themselves, the, one of the consumers generates these oscillations. That's a really beautiful thing if you think about it. It generates these oscillations, which is kind of a, you know, they do all exhibit these oscillations in real life. And by doing that, it is, makes it possible for its competitor to come in, but they're separated in time. Same resource, separated in time, but it's not what you think as a temporal niche partition. Usually we think of it that as a refuge or cold parts of the year, warm parts of the year. No, this is just different parts of the cycle, but a cycle happens over time, right? The resource is abundant now at a trough, I don't know, two weeks from now, 
So the thing is, on, so now we have to, when you look at the invasion criterion, you have to look at it over the period of the cycle. It's not a constant anymore, like when you actually do it. See, that's why we didn't calculate it. You have to take the integral over the, over the cycle period. And that's why the armstrong McGee paper is, uh, it, it works that out. Right, so over the cycle period when you integrate it, if the, uh, if the resource abundance is, exceeds the species R star, then it will happen. So there is an actual concrete rigorous way to check this. I'm trying, I'm trying to, to build an example in my mind uh, and it's been difficult. Because I, I remember that uh, plants that use water they, they can have different uh, resource use, and one may be better at exploiting water, but when water is scarce, the other uh, that's actually okay. prevails. Yeah, so that's kind of interesting because then you're part, but it's a different thing because there's an abiotic variable there. So it's not, but here like this happens in like, so I study this insect system. So there is this host insect and there are two parasitoids these insect parasitized that attack the host eggs. One of them has a very nonlinear function as well. So on its own, it generates oscillations. The other one is just like the second species. It has, uh, it, it has leads to damped oscillations. So they can actually, in a model, they can coexist. Now in real life, they also engage in integral parasitism, so it's not the perfect system. If you said that didn't happen, so they, so you can have that anytime. So see with the past, so with the, in your case, it's the water availability that's driving it. So the water, that's an external source of abiotic variation. We are saying, we forget about all that. Can the organisms generate the nonlinearity? Right? See, that's a, it's a, it's a good, so that's why for plants it's trickier because plants need things, they vary over time. So that comes more in the first one, the trade-off one, kind of, right? You could say one species is really good at extracting water when it's a drought period or like a low points and they're like really deep roots or something and then the other ones like only surface so it can really do well but on average, you know, on average, their per capita growth rates when they're rare have to be, if they're both positive, then they can coexist. So that's the thing, sometimes it's not instantaneous. Like here it has to occur through the cycle, right? So you have to integrate across the appropriate time period. Sometimes in a real life that could be a year, you know, over the year or whatever the time frame, the generation time, okay? So there's an element of time in some of these, like when you have time varying things like this one, the trade-off is a fixed thing, right? You, you know, one species is good at one thing and the other species is good at another thing. Whereas if you look at these fluctuations, that's a time varying phenomenon, right? It changes over time. So then you have to take, integrate across the appropriate time period, okay? So you can read the armstrong McGee paper and I, that's why I didn't go into it, there's a lot of integration. And not really hard, but the more important thing is not to worry about what you do with the integration, but to understand why it happens, okay? So this gives, sets you up with all the background to go and kind of explore this more. In fact, it turns out to be fairly common, this mechanism, but of course, you know, you could also have abiotic variation driving that. So say, for example, rainfall could be driving plant abundance, right? And then that could be oscillatory, but it's uh, externally forced, okay? So we are doing the minimal thing, we are saying, so of course, um, tomorrow, I guess, I will start working on, we will look at spatial dimension. Okay, all right, any other questions? Yes. Can you say that interspecific competition is intra-guild uh, competition? Interspecific competition is? Uh, intra-guild competition or not at all? Oh yeah, yeah, so here you could say like, so generally a guild is species that use the same trophic level, like at the same trophic level, right? So. Uh, and we can model with more than one guild? Yeah. Yeah? So more than one species, you mean two, more than two species? Yeah, oh, this is all generalizable to N species. Of course it gets harder because then you have to invoke trade-offs along an axis or have oscillatory dynamics. But 
uh, it's, it's a the models are generalizable, definitely in principle. So you mathematically they are. But you can remember that when you have more species, more diffuse competition, right? So the, it's probably not as strong as this. When you have two species, you're just really impacting your, but if you have a lot of species, some may not even come into contact, right? Like, you know, some, like you, the resource may be deprived, you know, you may suffer from your neighbor's uptake of the resource, but not a species that, you know, not an, you know, a species that's a little bit farther along on the resource spectrum or something. Like seed eaters. Yeah. Okay. Thanks.